the more seeds and the narrow the rows, we're seeing more disease. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. It's a pleasure to have you with us as we talk about all things ag related. And today is no different, of course. Um, I want to encourage you to like these videos and subscribe to these videos by clicking on the bell icon down below. And also make sure you share these videos with others. Thanks to your help, we continue to grow this channel and we remain one of the fastest growing ag podcasts out there anywhere. And it's all thanks to you. So we appreciate that and thanks very much. Well, today I have with me Rodrigo Anafre, and uh, he is a uh, row crop pathologist or row crop specialist with Kansas State University Extension. He's based in Manhattan. It's a pleasure, Rodrigo, to have you with us. Um, this is a kind of a critical time of year. Not only is corn tasseling and pollinating around the country, but now I'm starting to hear stories of um, plant disease, like rust in, uh, and different kinds of disease moving into the corn crops. And especially with the low prices on corn right now, farmers are at a bit of a crossroads whether they should treat or not. I bet you're getting a lot of calls about it right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Marley, thank you for, for having me here today. It's a pleasure. Um, yes, you're right. Well, solder rust, it's been a while. Uh, well, it's been around for a while now, right? And it's one of those diseases that does not survive in corn residue. So what we call is like the rust pathway, right? It starts from those southern states and Georgia, I would say Arkansas, Louisiana, Arkansas. And when it reaches Arkansas soon enough, um, we'll, we'll pick it up here in Kansas as well. Um, so basically what happened is uh, July 1st, uh, we got a report of Southern Rust being detected here in Kansas. Um, we verified that sample and, and sure enough, we got, we got it, right? Um, I think as you said, um, due to the corn price being so, so low right now, um, more than ever, we need to be very cautious by calling that application um, to control southern rust, right? Where did you find that first case? So it was like so, uh, South Central Kansas is the first place where we found it, uh, Sedwick County. Um, so it's right on that South Central area, right? And then the neighboring states, the neighbor counties, I'm sorry, um, were, were truly positive too. We found samples there and then we found a couple of samples now in the Northeast part of the state. Um, Shawnee is positive now, and also Donovan and Atchison too, right? They're bordering with Missouri, getting close to Nebraska and Iowa as it moves north, right? But I would say, yeah, we're central and eastern right now. Well, what kind of conditions does it thrive on? From what I understand, common rust needs wet conditions, but southern rust thrives on hot, dry conditions. Is that right? Yeah, I guess. Uh, well, let's just back up a little bit here, right? Um, common rust for us in Kansas, it's a more like a early season aesthetic damage that we see it that more like cinnamon brown type of rust and posture, right? That kind of almost like a dark red. Um, southern rust, it's that bright orange spores that we see it. Uh, southern rust is also typically on the upper side of the leaf, on the top of the leaf. It doesn't typically goes on both uh, sides of the leaves, different than common rust, which, you know, again, the common rust is that dark red spores and you see it on both sides of the leaf, right? Um, so both rust, they, they like water, um, but southern rust likes hot and, and humid and hot and wet conditions, right? The common rust likes more the mild temperatures um, early season for us here would be when we find it more. So how risky is southern rust to the corn crop? I mean, is there a lot of yield loss potential from that? Really depend of the year, right? And the, and the pathology side, we always go back into the disease triangle, right? You have to have the perfect weather conditions where we talk about hot and, and wet, right? With rain, humidity as well as the susceptible hosts, which some of our hybrids now, they, they do have a really good package towards Southern Rust and the disease being present. So now that we have Southern Rust here in Kansas, I would say, you know, look at the crop. It's time to intensify our scouting efforts, right? So we wanna make sure what's the growth stage? Are we around tasseling? Um, are we, do we have a susceptible hybrid to Southern Rust? And do we have the disease present in your field? If you check out the box, definitely you might have to think about a fungicide application for that. But 
But if you have a suscept uh, a resistant hybrid and we're passing that R3 growth stage, um, I don't think there's much to do, right? The return of investment around R4 and R5, it's very, very hard and very unlikely to happen. Now, are you seeing this, uh, for example, in Missouri as well? I assume it's in Oklahoma. So there are two reports in Missouri. Um, I think, let me check here, Lewis County and the uh, northeast part of the state and Andrew County, which is bordered here with Kansas, right? There are two, this, this two reports in Missouri. Um, so far, there are no reports in, in Oklahoma. There are quite a few in Arkansas. And I think in Kansas now we have um, seven counties with, with southern rust being active. Southern rust been a problem for the corn crop there. So last time there was like, a, I would say, a pretty good epidemic here was around 2020, where you could walk a field and with your white shirt and being orange at the other side, right? Those are the situations where we don't want to be. But again, you have to have that combination of, you know, not being present, the right growth stage, the early that we are into the crop at higher risk, we're going to be right. Um, so Eastern Kansas right now, the majority of the crop has passed R2, R3. Um, we're almost there where, you know, the close that we get to R5, which is our physiological maturity, right? That's when things stop, right? Like our youth potential, it's 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 done by then, right? What we call the black layer. Uh, but central Kansas and western Kansas, there are a lot of crop that hasn't made into tasseling yet. Um, I think, you know, our efforts towards southern rust is intensifying scouts um, on that central Kansas as well, western Kansas. And of course, other states too that haven't passed tasseling, right? Or getting around tasseling. Um, it's definitely important to keep an eye for it, especially Nebraska, Iowa, and those states in the, the northern part too. Is there even a treatment that's effective for it? So Crop Protection Network has a really good, um, what we call efficacy table where growers can go and check. Um, there are several products there varying from good to very good to excellent against uh, Southern rust. And just keep in mind, right, those products will be also fighting other diseases such as gray leaf spot, tar spot, which is a big topic right now, um, and as well, northern corn leaf blight. Well, and that leads me to my next question. I was going to ask you about those two, gray leaf spot, tar spot. Uh, tar spot's been on the increase here in recent years, right? Yes, I, I think tar spot... Um, you know, if we think since when it started 2015, um, it didn't take much to spread across, you know, the majority of our corn region production regions, right? Um, here in Kansas, we found it very early this year. We found it May 27, um, but so far it has remained, I'd say, pretty low levels, a few fields that disease has progressed a little bit more. Um, I'd say if you're scouting for tar spot, there's a really good app called Field Profit too. Um, it was developed by Damon Smith in Wisconsin University. There are thousands of data behind that app. And basically I really enjoy that working with Damon and the app as well, because it just, it gives you the risk for that day, but also for the next seven days, right? So if you're considering application, um, definitely it's an extra tool that's there for, for you grower that's, thinking about um, that application. Is gray leaf spot much of a problem where you are? So gray leaf spot, yes, uh, especially here in this river valley where we have a lot of humidity and rain, right? Um, I think it's one of the diseases here in Kansas that we fight yearly. There are some hybrids that are very susceptible. So application timing again around that VT, R1, it's it's very important for, for some growers. Now, what about the conditions? I know if you go north of Kansas, like in the upper Missouri River Valley, where they had all the flooding uh, earlier this year, or I should say the right. Missouri, uh, the middle part of the Missouri Valley. Uh, would that make the crops in that area more prone to disease pressure this year, just because there was so much water around? Yeah, absolutely. Especially for some of the disease that we're talking about, right? Tar spot and uh, Gray leaf spot, southern rust too. I think that northeast part of Kansas, although we don't have much irrigation there, our um, annual rain, uh, I think it's it's very significant, right? The growers there, some of them are producing 250 bushels per acre. It's a say high high yield environment. There's a lot of investments behind it, and the conditions 
typically are really good for a disease too. Well, what other concerns have you got on, uh, not only just on corn, but also on uh, grain sorghum and soybeans right now? Yeah, well, grain sorghum for us here in Kansas is stock rots is one of our main concerns, right? Um, especially stock rots is one of the diseases that, you know, you go through the season, you might not see it when they're about to harvest and then a lot of lodging is occurring, right? Um, we do have some trials where we're looking to at planting different ways to manage the disease and as, as well as the cropping system, right? Trying to kind of like redefine our recommendations uh, for stock rots and seeing like um, row spacing and plant population, how is that affecting stock rots? Um, soybeans, we're seeing a little bit of frog eye leaf spot um, so far. Say it's still very low. Uh, typically, it's not a big problem disease wise for us here in Kansas. Um, as we go into, um, you know, the reproductive states, right, this river valley, northeast, north central Kansas, we do see quite a bit of sudden death syndrome. So if you have had problems before, you know what I'm talking about. But now it's also a good time to identify those fields and areas so you can plan, uh, uh, say, a management for the upcoming season, right? The things that we're seeing today will definitely... Um, you know, some of them we can start thinking even for the next year. How do you treat that? Or is there anything you can do for it? Yeah, well, sudden death syndrome soybeans is a very interesting disease. It takes more than one tool definitely to manage. Um, you know, seed treatments still our to go methods for, for managing fighting sudden death syndrome. Um, we do have a project with the soybean, um, the Kansas Soybean Commission, where we're looking to row spacing plant population. And what we are seeing right now, it's the more seeds and the narrow the rows, we're seeing more disease. Um, and the other thing, in addition, right, that we're finding here is our rotation is typically corn and beans. And there was this trial that we did it together with Eric AD in the agronomy department where we increase the levels of phosphorus before corn planting. And by doing that, we reduce the amount of disease in the field. Uh, so we're kind of like indirectly managing SDS by improving our fertility, right? Um, which is which is a phenomenal uh, result for our growers too, so. Well, I know you've had some extremes in your uh, growing season weather there between Eastern Kansas and Western Kansas. That's been going on for a few years now. Um, given the extremes you have had, how would you rate the maturity of the Kansas crops this year? I mean, are they pretty much on schedule? Are they running behind? Are they running ahead? What What do you think here? Yeah, no, definitely. We're, we're seeing everything here. I think we're seeing crops that are really advanced and looking really good. And as well, in the western Kansas, we have had some hail damage there um, as well. So it's, it's definitely been a challenging year. Um, definitely some of the locations are getting I'd say really good moisture, but some hot spots too, uh, quite dry. So I think overall, um, it's been, I would say, a, a good season um, so far. Uh, but definitely, we do have some hot spots with either drought or uh, being affected by the some hail um, events that's happening. Well, I know I have heard a lot of stories about the extreme positive basis for corn in the southwestern part of the state and feedlot areas there. Um, gosh, I think it's like a dollar and a half over what you can get for corn in the Dakotas. But I'm just curious. Um, I know a lot of folks, especially in eastern Kansas, will plant dryland corn. I just wondered how soon that would come online, in your opinion. Are we maybe a month away yet, or what do you think here? I think harvest-wise, we're, you know, I'd say early September, we might be seeing some folks harvesting mid-September uh, some of the corn. We do have some maturity group where we're, we're trying to fight disease through maturity as well and see how much would that compensate, right? Um, but definitely, I think around September, we'll definitely start chopping some corn here for sure. All right. Well, thank you for the update, Rodrigo. It's been a pleasure talking with you, and uh, I'll probably be checking in with you later on in the year to see how things go. But uh, thank you for all the information and for the work you do. It's excellent stuff. Uh, Rodrigo Anafri, uh, he's joining us from the Kansas State University's Extension Service. He's in Manhattan, Kansas. That'll do it for this episode. And thanks again for joining us for producer Brianne Hendrickson.
I'm Marlon Bowling. We'll catch you next time right here on the Comstock Channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.